Welcome to The Creative Influencer, where we discuss all things creative with an emphasis on influencers. The Creative Influencer is hosted by John Pfeiffer. John is an entertainment attorney in Santa Monica, California, who represents influencers and other creatives. This is episode three of the fifth season of the Creative Influencer Podcast. Today, we interview Taylor Rochester. Taylor is the author of A New 2020 Vision, Cultivate Joy, Reprogram Your Mind, and Define a Life Through an Authentic Lens. And, by the way, he is also a professional basketball player. Taylor shares his fascinating journey and insight about finding happiness in the 99% of life that we tend to ignore. He also talks about his use of social media in promoting his book and shifting his social media persona and posts from personal to public facing. This is a fun interview. Enjoy. I am joined today by Taylor Rochester. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, man. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, You are the author of a uh, book called A New 2020 Vision, Cultivate Joy, Reprogram Your Mind, and Define Life Through an Authentic Lens. You're also, as we'll come to find out, you're also a husband and a father and a speaker and, oh, by the way, a professional basketball player. Um, you are a point guard, correct? I am. I am. And I, I respect you so much because you put basketball player last. Usually that's what started with. So I love it. I love that the book came first. So we're going to take a deep dive into the book, but I want to kind of set the scene on who you are. Um, you went to high school, <clears throat> excuse me, at that hotbed of all schools known for basketball legends, <laughs> Santa Barbara. Yeah, we we got a couple we got a couple people up on the wall. We got Don uh, Don Wilkes. I mean, smart Jamal Wilkes. We got uh, Don Ford. So we got a couple a couple guys that people might know, but it's not the uh, it's not the typical place to come out and play basketball for sure. But you are the when you left, you were the all time scoring leader in school history. Mm-hmm. And then you went to Tulane. How did you go from Santa Barbara to Tulane? Well, I was I was really not recruited out of high school, uh, and I don't blame that on anybody. Uh, I think recruiting is such a difficult process. There's so many kids coming out of high school trying to play basketball. So um, I was thinking of walking on. I went on a couple um, Division two and Division three uh, recruiting trips, um, and then my AAU coach asked me to come play in a couple more tournaments my senior year of high school towards the end, which is really late for recruiting process. And I ended up playing really great in this one tournament down in Houston and um, against a team and against a player. And I can't uh, remember the name now that was, everybody was there to see play. Um, And that was just right place at the right time. And uh, Tulane was one of the teams there and they offered me a late scholarship to come, uh, come to new Orleans just from the tournament down in Houston, Texas. And then uh, something called Katrina happened. Yeah, second second day of my sophomore year, you know, I I got there with most of my stuff. Let's just call it a Thursday, and then you know, um, Friday morning I woke up. A couple people were crying in the, the place that I was around the place that I was staying, and saying, you know, we got to evacuate, and there's different stuff going on with family. And luckily, my mom lived in Houston, lives in Houston, Texas, and uh, you know, I took half of my stuff, thinking I'd come back for the rest of it, and uh, drove to my mom's apartment in Houston, and ended up riding out uh, Katrina there for a little while. And then eventually transferred to Washington State. Yeah, two, yeah. Two, two real good years with Washington State led them to the tournament. Um, so recently, we, well, when you were in playing basketball in college, you could not capitalize on your name, image, and likeness. Which <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the NCAA recently changed the rules as of July 1. What's your take on that? So I was prepared to talk bad. about a lot. I was prepared to talk about a lot of stuff, but this is maybe too intense for everyone. <laughs> uh, you know, um, it's a difficult one because um, you know I, I come from a very um, uh, lucky upbringing. You know, being from Santa Barbara, California, having uh, incredible parents, incredible um, uh, childhood. It's hard to comment on um, the the needs and the the wants and the desires and the, um, and the whole idea of what everybody is going through uh, as a college athlete. Mm-hmm. 
I always knew I was going to go to college. Um, I was very focused on academics and sports um, and knew that I wanted to play sports. So when I got to college, college is so pure. And I like the purity of, of college sports. Now, the NCAA might not necessarily be so pure, but I feel like the college sports itself for the players is so pure. You're playing the game you love um, with friends, um, with your t- with your teammates, but not only that, but with all the people that you're living around. Uh, it's a community. College sports is just so incredible. Um, and so I hate the idea of changing it. Uh, as long as we're changing things for the better and it's benefit, benefiting people and people are finding happiness and joy from that, and it's uh, helping the game get better and, and helping um, to enhance the student athlete uh, experience. And I think that's great. Uh, at the same time, I hope to not see the purity of the of the sport, at least from the athlete side, go away. So. Well, we'll see how it shakes out. It's, yeah, it's here to stay. Um and you have been playing professional basketball. Is this going to be your 13th season? Finished my 12th season. Yeah, 13th is coming up right now. I have a contract to go play in China. Um, although uh, they, they announced about a month ago that foreigners are, are not being included in the, um, in the league. And then now they're recently saying that the foreigners will probably be coming back. So I'm going through a China visa uh, process right now and then looking to start my 13th season next month, maybe. And you've played all over the world. How has that been? I mean, you played on teams I can't pronounce. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I played on teams I can't pronounce. And the, the best part is having all those teams trying to pronounce my last name, trying to say Rochester in, in 10 different languages and in different countries with different accents. It's been really fun. Um, it's been the best experience ever. Uh, I met my wife while playing in France. Uh, now half my family is in uh, France, uh, you know, having to learn about different cultures, trying to learn different languages. Um, just trying to open my mind up to so many different experiences, which helped shape uh, ideas in the book, which has helped shape me as a person. And definitely I uh, want to take all the best things that I've learned and kind of incorporate that into who I am, and who my family is and who my kids are and, and hopefully enhance their experience uh, of real education, which is the world education. I've read when you were trying to learn French that you had like post-it notes or index cards uh, all over the house with the name of whatever the object was. Yeah. I, I think true? it's a, it's a, it, it's a perfect example for, I like to talk about highlighting happiness. Um, and so with French, when you're trying to learn French, you got to highlight it in your life and you got to make it part of your daily life or learning any language. So I was putting little sticky notes all over my house and trying to like uh, remember what this was or that was and just so I'm walking by and constantly reminded uh, by the word, and the same thing deals with happiness. I'm trying to surround myself so much with things that create joy and happiness in my life that makes it um, almost impossible to just walk down the hallway or walk by uh, any room or any uh, place without feeling some type of joy or happiness by these triggers that I can put around me. And I'm, I'm jumping ahead, but this is the perfect time to ask it. How has COVID impacted that, that journey to try to keep happiness right front and center? Well, first and foremost, COVID uh, totally, completely reshifted everything when it came to basketball for me. Um, I, I went to a, a city and a place that I really, really loved. I was uh, playing in Athens, Greece for a team that's incredible um, and a place that I really wanted to be. Um, my daughter was young at the time and we were pregnant with our second kid. And um, I really wanted to make that kind of a home and realize that and I've been moving around a lot, but let's try to find you know, some common ground and let's try to find some consistency for the family. And right when I was feeling that and trying to renegotiate a contract, that's when COVID hit season ended, try to figure out what's going on here, where we're going to have our son, where we're going to give birth. And so we flew to France and we waited for China and China didn't allow visas. And so I couldn't get there. And so now it's waiting around to see what's next. And it really shook me up as far as uh, the basketball world, which is also the family world, you know, being a leader of the family and trying to trying to provide for my family and take them to a successful place for us to be happy. Uh, that really shifted things up. But I think on a joy and happiness scale, I think that people lost out on being able to plan and they lost out on a lot of optimism. And those are two big things that people um, need in their life to really uh, cultivate that joy. People like planning things. People like being optimistic and looking forward to things. And when the world is telling you how you need to live your life, it's a really dangerous um, place for a lot of individuals to be. They feel very victimized by what's happening around them. And they don't feel like they have choices or they have control to cultivate that joy. And so uh, you have to make a conscious effort every day to realize there are still choices to make. Even if you're in quarantine, 
even if you're away from your family, even if you're um, not able to go to work or not able to even walk down the street, there's different choices you can make each day to try to better your world and cultivate that joy. For sure. Now, I, I was listening to an interview where they were talking about coming out of COVID, that what you should do is make an inventory of the things that changed that you want to keep in your life. So let me ask you this, what changed that you weren't doing pre-COVID that you now want to keep in your life after COVID? You know, it was interesting because I was, I was lucky to have an amazing distraction, which was my, the birth of my son. Um, so having, having two young kids, um, you're just dealing with uh, the craziness that is having two under two and a half. And so I think uh, my world was changing exponentially every day as far as just learning how to be a good father, learning how to be a good husband, learning how to be a good friend, um, realizing that people need connection uh, more than I ever believed before and just reaching out and realizing if I'm not having a good day or I don't feel purposeful today, that I can call someone and, and create joy for them. And I can just um, help people, a lot of people that are in need and in need of that connection and need of that um, communication that we missed out on during COVID. So I think, I think uh, realizing that you have a big impact to make on your own life, but a big impact to make on other people's life was something that was very clear to me during COVID that I want to continue, uh, continuing to reach out towards other people. Uh, we're going to get to the book in just a second, but it occurred to me, I, for, I forgot to ask, when you're playing on, on these teams with uh, players from different countries, how do you communicate? How do you? I'm lucky. I'm lucky because English is the the language of basketball. It's the number one world language. Um, so that's very, very lucky for me. So wherever I go, I might have like a Serbian coach, but I'm playing in Spain and I have a German teammate. I have, a, you know, an Italian teammate and then some Spanish teammates. So we have to have a common language. So most of the time, the common language is English. Um, every now and then I've had a translator in China. Uh, my teammates do not speak English. Um, so my coaches did not speak English and I had a translator and the person would be, te- you know, giving us a five minute speech and then the translation would just be play hard, you know, <laughs> it's just so, uh, there, there's certain, there's definitely certain things that get lost, it gets lost in translation, but you just have to be super adaptable and, and really be open-minded and really want to learn, um, not just the language, uh, which I'm terrible at and can't learn all these languages, but just learn how to read body language and learn how to um, ask the right questions and learn how to really focus in on everything that you can control. Um, you shifting gears. Let's, let's talk about the promotion of the book and your use of social, social media. Uh, you are a Twitter and Instagram person and uh, Instagram as near as I can tell was used more for the promotion of the book. Uh, in pre launch, you had a countdown. Um, who came up with that idea? So, um, I had writing the book was one thing. Launching the book was so difficult and so much fun to learn as much as I could, because I, if somebody needed advice in the basketball world and they came to me, pretty much anything they came to me with, I'll be able to give them great direction moving forward. When it came to a book, I have a great net, network of people around me. Uh, through my parents and friends and family, but nobody had really written and launched a book anytime recently or um, in this category. So I was learning so much. And then I realized that with my young kids and with my job, I would just, I didn't want to be on my phone that much. And it was really, really hard for me to be on my phone. So um, my teammate, um, his fiance um, is a social media manager. And so I started sitting down and talking with her and she helped me come up with a lot of different themes and different ideas, trying to move my social media stuff from more personal um, to more public, um, trying to have a different image, um, teaching me the importance of social media and how you can kind of leverage that with the book and creating a, um, you know, a better profile for yourself. So she really helped me with that. She helped me with the countdown and then she helped me kind of spend a lot of time one day coming up with a bunch of content and then knowing how to space that out and then not have to be on my phone all the time trying to create new content. But it's a, it's a different world. I I try not to be on my phone. I try to be very present. Um, And at the same time, realizing that that's a big uh, thing for trying to promote a book for sure. Right. No, it it, it was successful. I mean, I, it was enjoyable to go back, even though the book has been launched, I watched the pre-launch sequence and it was fun to watch. Uh, Cool. Thank you. So so let's, uh, let's shift to the book. What inspired, I read that uh, you wrote the book initially as a letter to your daughter. 
What was the thought process? So yeah, my my family's got some great traditions. We do some goofy things for Christmas and holidays and stuff like that. And then so I'm always constantly, I got a crazy mind that's constantly thinking of things that would be fun. What would be fun? What would be fun for the family? And I thought when, when my daughter was about to be born, what would be fun? I wanted to write her a letter to give to her when she graduated high school. And so she knew how I felt when she was born. And she'd be like, wow, 18 years ago, you wrote me this letter. How great. Um, and I could really write down all my thoughts and ideas for her. And I had all these goals and aspirations and ideas. And and I wanted her to, um, I thought about it like a relay race. I wanted to give her the baton for, for life. So she's in the best way, you know, best position to win. And um, kind of all the things that I've learned. And I just gathered all those things together and just started writing them down. And then when I had more and more time to write, I really loved the process and fell in love with writing. And then I went out to China and I had a lot of time to myself traveling and in hotels and trains and planes and then created those into chapters and then soon into a book. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit two chapters. Uh, <laughs> chapter four is reprogramming the mind. And on page 70, you write, when we talk about happiness, we must replace the idea of being with the experience of feeling. What did you mean? I think a lot of people, um, um, they, they talk about this idea. First of all, happiness is a lot to deal with success. Uh, and these people have this idea, if I have this, if this is going well, I'm happy. And it's this state that like, it's, it's almost like a noun. There's a thing there. And if I have it, I'm happy. And it's, uh, we need to understand that we can cultivate this idea with whatever's going on. We can create happiness for ourselves and joy for ourselves. And we need to, we need to replace a lot of these norms that we've had over the years on what it means to be happy and, uh, and create less ups and downs and have a little bit more sustainability. So we need to create that idea of, of, you know, feeling happy and being happy and, and, cultivating it from the inside as opposed to having it just fall in our laps or just achieve something and becoming happy. So, so getting my Ferrari is not going to make me happy. <laughs> Definitely not, but I, I'm really excited about that for you. The Ferrari, <laughs> the Ferrari is a good look. I just have my eye. <laughs> uh, on uh, page 71, you talk about reprogramming your morning intake. What do you mm. mean? What do you mean? This 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 one's a big one for me, and, and it deals with the phone again, like we just talked about. I think the first thing that we do in the morning is we reach for our phone, and uh, I like to talk about all the things that go into our mind before our feet even touch the floor from the bed. And so we have all this stuff happening. We check our phone, we turn off the alarm, whatever it might be, and immediately we see texts that we got or we didn't get. We see what the weather is going to be like. We see what the stock market is going to be like. We see likes that we got or we didn't get on Instagram. We have so many things that are going on in our mind that are telling us if we're going to have a good day or not before we even get in touch with ourselves, before we even put a foot on the ground. We're already feeling a little bit gloomy because it's not going to be sunny out today or the weather is going to be bad. And so we need to wake up and we need to get in touch with ourselves and realize our goals and aspirations for the day, how we're feeling. What motivates us uh, at night? There's a nightly intake. You can write down goals and write down lists and things that you want to accomplish, things that can help you become better, things that can help you inspire others. There's all these different things that we can focus on. And I, and I talk about that the internal needs to affect the external. And in the morning intake, most of the time, the external is affecting the internal. And we don't realize like, man, why am I in a bad mood today? Well, I didn't check in with myself before I checked in with the world. And the world is telling me it's not going to be a good day today. And the world is giving me bad news. But not really help if I hear that. So it it's definitely has more impact on me than it would if I let the internal affect the external. So what is your morning routine? Well, there's so much written by different people. My but... morning routine is waking up. Yeah. Mine is um, two words. The, my first two words are thank you. Um, I have an idea of seeking out gratitude and seeking out thankfulness. So if I woke, wake up in the morning and I say thank you, then I have to go out in the world and see all the things I'm thankful for. Um, then I do, um, sadly enough, I do 11 push-ups because I told myself I was going to do 10 every morning. It's a way to shock my system, especially when I'm tired into waking up. 
But I started doing 10. And I realized I'm just going to do one extra. And then that became a thing. And so I started just doing 11 push ups. I say thank you. And then I just, I seek out thankfulness. Um, and then I can just look around and I can, I can find a hundred things in just my room that I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for having a bed, a roof over my head. I'm thankful for my incredible wife. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for so many things um, before I can even take a look at my phone. And, and normally I'm waking up at about 530 with my son crying and I'm thankful that he's crying. I'm thankful that he's there. I'm thankful that I can be a dad and I'm thankful that I can impact his life and inspire him. So it, it just totally reprograms my mind um, just by saying those two words every morning. How old is your son now? My son is 14 months. The daughter will be three in October. Um, on page 80 of the book, you talk about reprogramming. I'm tired. Ooh. So many of us, yes. So many of us say, "I'm tired all day long." How do you reprogram? I'm tired. You you realize how much you're saying it first and foremost. It's like you first the first thing about a problem is realizing you have a problem. And so with with athletes especially, oh my gosh, every day I come home, I'm sore, I'm tired, I'm sore, I'm tired, I'm tired. I don't want to do this. And once you realize that most of the time it's just an auto response to things. You just get up and you just do it. You, you just you, you just tell yourself the next five things I'm asked to do, I'm just going to get up and do. And you realize that it doesn't take that much energy to be kind. It doesn't take much energy to have a good attitude. It doesn't take energy to say nice things to nice people. And even if you're tired physically, um, you don't need to be tired with your communication. You don't need to be tired with your effort in other, in other things. And so just understanding how much you're saying some form of I'm tired, um, and you're giving yourself these excuses in your head and, and pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone and realizing that you have a lot more to give than you think. And then this is the last one on chapter four, but on page 88, reprogramming the fear of the unknown. That's so much of what been, we've been facing in the last year and a half. How do you reprogram that? Well, for, for, for me personally, uh, I like to, I've evolved that into realizing there's so many choices that we have. And we just have to figure out um, all these choices and all these decisions we're making and releasing the anxiety and realizing all the good things that are coming from our choices instead of under, you know, instead of focusing on the potential bad things or the grass is always greener and I would have, could have, should have and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of unknown, especially in my job. And right now, I don't even know if I'm going to be living in China in a couple of weeks. I don't know if I'll be living with or without family. I don't know if I have to fly my family to France. There's so much of the unknown. Um, but I'm so focused on that gratitude and thankfulness. Um, and I'm so much in tune with my love for life. Um, in the Bible, it says perfect love drives out fear. So I'm just, I'm choosing love over fear and I'm going after things, um, with whole, well, wholeheartedly, um, because life is short, man. I'm watching my kids grow up and I don't want them to grow up any faster. They're just growing up too quick. And I'm just, I'm not going to be fearful of that. I'm just going to continue to love and I'm going to continue to see all the great things that I have in my life which is a perfect transition to chapter five is finding daily happiness. <laughs> <laughs> and you write on page 133, be courageous today. How do you go about that each day? I think some people are, um, they get locked into um, different stereotype, different boxes. They put themselves in it. People put themselves in it. They're, they've been a shy person. And so they, they, just come about they're like oh, i'm shy i'm not really gonna go do that and being shy is um uh, is totally great you know for people that are shy people that's fantastic but you can realize that at any moment you can give yourself five seconds of courage 10 seconds of courage 15 seconds of courage if there's an attribute that you really love then just add that to your life for for one hour just say that i can do that for one hour or one day and just see how it feels see if um see if um you know, it can become part of who you are. Do it two days out of the month, three days out of the month. And so realize that you can be who you want to be at any moment. And that doesn't mean you have to reprogram your whole life, but that just means that every moment is a chance to, to be courageous um, and, and tackle a fear that you might have or tackle an insecurity that you might have. And this is, it's, it's like you planned this in the book. <laughs> it kind of flows. On page 137, then you say, excel in your 95%. What do you mean by that? So we're all, um, 
we're all looking for our pinnacle 5%. And that's the, the reprogramming that we need to do. And that's the daily focus that we need to make where it's like, okay, we have a promotion. We have a, a birthday coming up. We have a weekend coming up. We have uh, whatever it might be that's the really exciting things in your life. You got to focus on the things in between the big things because the journey is the outcome. The journey is the most important thing. And you're, we're missing out on this 95% of our life because we're focused on that pinnacle. Uh, 95 is the meat, is everything. That's the small thing you have. Those are the little relationship that you have. Go to the coffee shop and get to know the person that works at the coffee shop. Um, get to, you know, be kind to the people that you're walking by. Realize that there's people that you work with that you don't even know and get to know them. Realize their hopes and fears and desires. Get to know yourself. Um, realize what makes you tick. There's so many little things happening every single day around you that we're not focusing on because we're too focused either on our phones or some exciting thing that we're looking forward to. And it's great to look forward to stuff, but we can't forget um, you know, what's happening in our daily life. And so that when we say, hey, I'm going to focus on the 95%, I'm going to focus on all the little things today. I'm going to realize that this breeze feels good, you know, as something as small as that. Uh, and then you shifts your, your day and realizes that you have so much um, potential in each day uh, instead of just looking forward to, let's say, the weekend. So I was remiss because I asked you before we started recording, but you are currently where? I'm in Santa Barbara, California. Which would explain the palm tree behind you. Yeah, I tried to get as stereotypical as I could. So I, I <laughs> sat here with the palm tree. <laughs> it works. What was your biggest challenge you faced when you wrote the book, in writing the book? Um, I think um, the biggest challenge I have probably in life, and this is a good thing to ask my wife, <laughs> is uh, I, we call it landing the plane. You know, I have all these ideas. Okay, just land the plane and, ju and just finish something. So I have, I think the book um, does a great job with trying to connect with as many people on as many levels as possible. It's not about my journey. It's about the reader's journey. And it's about sharing my journey in order to connect with the reader. And I think everybody can have something that they can um, connect with, but there, it, it's so broad and there's so many different things that I try to talk about. I think that that, um, that was the toughest thing for me to try to narrow it down because the second that I finish it, I'm like, oh, I got all these other ideas that I want to add into it. I got another book that I need to write uh, or this is not finished. And it's, 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 it's art, you know, it's, it's never finished. And, um, I just wanted to to release it, get it out, and have my thoughts and my love and my passion and my feelings into a book and be able to share that with people. So I don't think there was too many big difficulties, um, but it was just a great learning experience. Will there be a volume two? I definitely think there'll be a second book. If I go to China, mm -hmm. I talked with my wife about that. That I definitely want to um, mm -hmm. definitely want to start writing this uh, second book and narrow down maybe a couple specific things from the book and really um, tackle into those and get really real and really intimate with uh, only just a couple different um, ideas. So I have three last questions. And this is famous for lawyers saying I only have three questions. Three last questions. <laughs> First is, what are you working on right now? Uh, I'm working on being a, a, a better husband. I'm working on being a better father. I'm working on being a better friend. I'm working on um, being a better basketball player, working on uh, trying to write some stuff, cultivate some, some joy and happiness. I'm working on it inspiring as many people as I can, um, trying to coach and give all the knowledge I have to people. I could, I could list a thousand things. I'm just constantly inspired to try to be better and uh, to inspire people around. And where can people find your book? TaylorRochester.com. And I'm hoping that you can help people with the spelling of the name with some well, type of link or something like notes, that. Yes. Yeah, so taylorrochester.com. Taylor so actually, uh, yeah. um, because your name is on Zoom, uh, it is R-O-C-H-E-S-T-I-E. -E. Yeah. And Taylor, T-A-Y-L-O-R. And that's so taylorrochester.com. Yeah, uh, Instagram. You on Instagram, you can find that. Twitter, I think, is uh, T.C. Rochester, and my Instagram is T. Rochester. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm constantly updating. Like I said, I'm learning, so I'm constantly trying to, you know, help make a better website, make a better Instagram, make a better, that kind of stuff while still trying to be present in the moment and realize how special life is and, you know, being off all that stuff at the same time. So. So Taylor, this was, this was great. Let me stop the recording and I'll come right back to you. Thank you so much for having me. 
that's it for this time. If you enjoyed our podcast, please write a review on iTunes and tell your friends to subscribe. If you have any questions about influencers or suggestions for future episodes, email them to john at pfeifferpfeifferlaw.com. Thank you for listening.